<laughs> All right, well, thank you. Thanks very much, Brett. Um, um, my name's Risa Lieberwitz. As um, Brett explained, I have a couple of hats. One of the hats that I wear is as a professor of labor and employment law at um, the ILR School, School of Industrial and Labor Relations at Cornell University. And the other hat that I proudly wear is as general counsel of the American Association of University Professors, the AAUP. And I'm so pleased to be here um, to speak with you. And I'm also especially pleased to be here with uh, Julie Schmidt, who will be speaking in just a few minutes after, I'm, after I have a few words to say. Um, and Julie Schmidt is the executive director of AAUP. So thanks for inviting us. Um, and uh, here's the, the way that we're at least going to, to start um, with our presentations. I, I'm going to speak generally about the AAUP and um, uh, the organization and some of the background, which I think is, would be useful for a number of people who may or may not be deeply familiar with the AAUP. Um, and then Julie will talk with you more specifically about some of the campaigns, particularly the ones that, um, that Brett was just referring to. So let me just take a, a few minutes to begin with uh, a personal history and connecting that up to AAUP. And one of the reasons for starting with a personal history, and, and I, I promise I will be brief on the personal history part, but we all have stories, right? Every, every single person is here in part because of a personal story, a personal history that brings you to being interested in figuring out where you fit individually with a collective. You know, what, what is the nature of the sort of individual identity we have, how it develops, what our interests are, and where do we see ourselves broadly in society, but here in particular with regard to our colleagues and the organizations that are joining together to, to work uh, collectively. And I'm always fascinated to hear people's histories. I'm a labor lawyer. And so one of the things about being a labor lawyer is that you hear people's histories, how they relate to work. So let me just share a moment about my own and how it, can, it intersects with the AUP. So I'm at Cornell, I've been here since 1982. Um, and I, uh, I was in a, a, a very difficult tenure fight, a three year experience from 1987 to 1990 to a great extent that tenure struggle here uh, was because of the nature of my politics, my activism, and not only on campus in, in the activism, but because um, of the left critique that I brought into my research on um, and writing on freedom of speech, on rights to unionize. And then you add that all together with gender and you can sometimes end up in a tenure fight. So, Fortunately, it has a good ending. In 1990, I won that fight. And one of the reasons that I was able to gain tenure was because of the collective action that had occurred prior to my own fight. In the late 1970s at Cornell, there was a group called the Cornell 11 of women who sued Cornell for sex discrimination and various aspects of promotion. They didn't win the lawsuit, but out of that fight came a uh, Kind of a settlement that included a tenure appeals process, which was a collective gain that gave people like me a playing field to work on. So I owe my own individual, uh, an individual debt to that collective action. And after I got out of that tenure fight and, and was not only standing, but really quite victorious, I said, well, what, what, is, what happened to me? <laughs> what was this all about? I was already studying free speech in the workplace and writing about it, but I decided that it would be really important to study more about academic freedom and tenure in the university and how they developed. And so I read a wonderful book that some of you may have read uh, called No Ivory Tower by historian Ellen Schrecker who wrote about the AAUP and also wrote to a great extent about the McCarthy era generally. But I was fascinated to read the history of the AAUP and, um, and in particular the way in which it intersects with the conditions in which we were living in starting in the 1980s, uh, yeah, the 1980s with the Reagan um, administration 
bringing in privatization and the effects of that kind of privatization in universities and the intersection and, and um, parallels, more than intersection, the parallels between the 1980s on with privatization and inequalities of um, wealth and power on a class basis in society and lining those up next to the time at which the AUP was developed. So the AUP was founded in 1915 in a period coming from the mid to late 1800s into the early 1900s of industrialization, vast inequalities of um, concentrations of wealth and power on a class basis, and it sounded very much like what we were living through um, in the 1980s on. And so what do people do when they are working under such conditions? Well, they organize. And that's what the faculty did in the late 1800s into the early 1900s, culminating in the organization of the uh, AUP in 1915. This came out of particularly social scientists and developing disciplines in the social science, sciences and universities who were biting the hands that fed them in universities, as many of us do now, uh, writing, teaching, and, and publicly speaking about uh, conditions in society that required social reform. And that overlapped with many of the um, wealthy magnates like Stanford, who were giving massive amounts of, of money from industrialists from the, it used to be the thousands, it moved into the millions, into universities and including ones that they named after themselves like Stanford. And so faculty were being fired because of their speech and because of their social reform activities. And I read that and I said, well, of course, basically, the AUP came out of labor organizing. It was a collective demand for rights, labor rights in a particular profession. And what was extraordinary to me was that that occurred at a time when nobody in labor really had any rights at all in terms of the law. And so this was outside of the law, collective demand for what? For basic working conditions. Our bread and butter is academic freedom. As a, as a profession. It's not only the job security and the money, of course it is that, but it's academic freedom at its base. So it was demand for academic freedom for all of us in teaching, research, and our public speech. And it was a demand for the job security of tenure to protect that academic freedom. And it was a demand for really democratic self-governance, that the profession should govern itself. And that's where we get the concept of shared governance. So these these uh, basic principles and basic demands for rights were extraordinarily uh, powerful and also extraordinarily successful. So in 1940, uh, the AUP adopted its statement on academic freedom and tenure. And over the years, these principles have become um, institutionalized within universities across the United States. With regard to the AUP, of course, we have chapters on campuses all over the country. We call them either advocacy chapters in non-union settings or collective bargaining chapters where there is uh, unionization, which we can talk about more if you want. Um, and I'll go back to the institutionalized part in a moment, but I also want to mention to you that on the national AUP's website, just aup.org, you can find a treasure trove of statements, principles, and reports that have been uh, developed over the years in the AUP and on the ground kind of guidance how to start a campus uh, chapter, how to build that campus chapter, how to do organizing campaigns based on issues of importance to the faculty, how to build and strengthen uh, shared governance structures um, and create policies on academic freedom and due process and tenure. Um, so I, I hope that you delve into that and um, Julie in a moment is going to talk with you more specifically about that. But what I wanna go back to is this notion of institutionalizing these kinds of policies and principles and rights of academic freedom and tenure and due process and shared governance on campus. We're doing this work at this moment as we're all painfully aware of in the context of corporatization of the universities. 
again, that parallel to what was going on in the late 1800s, early 1900s, with the sort of privatization policies in society and globally, generally, and then the particular ways in which privatization has corporatized the university. In this context, we are, of course, also painfully aware of the changes that have come out of privatization and corporatization to the profession with the job insecurity, the nature of the contingency um, structure and stratification of the academic profession. And so as we organize in a profession where around 75% are now in non-tenure track positions, we're organizing in the objective material conditions of time and space that we live in. On top of that, we have the current crisis, the current public health crisis. So this is a moment to organize. It always is a moment to organize, but this is a moment to really organize across those stratified uh, tenure track, non-tenure track, graduate assistants, um, kinds of organizations of labor on campus. And in this moment of public health crisis, we are all paying attention in a big way. And so we need to, as Joe Hill says, not mourn, but organize with regard to the conditions we're in. And so I'm going to pass now the word to Julie. Okay, well, hopefully we don't end up like Joe Hill. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Thanks, Risa. Um, and I'll just pick up where Risa left off. I actually have a few slides and I'll share my screen in a minute. Um, but one thing I wanted to, to point out um, from, from what Risa just said that I think is really important to, to clarify regarding um, AAUP, and I'll get into it a little bit when I talk about our one faculty campaign, is the notion of tenure as it was originally um, construed by the AAUP, it's completely linked to uh, this idea of economic security for those teaching and researching in higher education so that they can have academic freedom. So they're free from um, corporate intrusion or legislative intrusion, you know, people from the outside or even people from the inside being able to fire them for saying things that they don't like, right? Um, it, uh, AAUP's definition of tenure is really just what you would call in a more kind of industrial labor setting, um, you know, seniority or seat time. Um, the way it's the way it is supposed to be construed is that after a certain number of years, you should have uh, you should have job security, and you should you, you know that there should be very limited reasons for which you can be uh, terminated. And I think, you know, it's sort of important to remind people of that at a time when the profession is almost 70% uh, off the tenure line, because I think because of um, austerity and the scarcity of tenure lines, uh, you know, just a completely manufactured <laughs> scarcity, um, people see it now as some sort of merit badge or something that's only for rock stars or the elites. Um, and in fact, I think those of us in academia perpetuate that, uh, that view of tenure. And um, when Reese and I were talking the other day, we were saying, you know, we should talk about the AAUP as it ain't your daddy's AAUP, but it also ain't your daddy's tenure. I mean, tenure was never supposed to be that. And, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we've ended up where we have with it, but it just, I kind of wanted to put a, um, a pin in that. So I think it's, it's, it's something we've been talking a lot of, about a lot in the office. And if it's okay with folks, I'm gonna do a screen share for a couple slides and then that'll link us over to um, some, some things on our website. Is that a yes? Okay. Let me see if I can do, this is my first time doing that. So let's see how this goes. Ooh, um, share screen. Uh, okay, this is what I wanna share and I'm gonna put it on, um, there we go. Nope, that's not where I wanted to start. Okay, hold on. No, nope, that's not. Oh, let me get back to the beginning. I'm sorry. This is, uh, that's where I wanted to start. Okay.
You know, it's not working either. Well, I seem to be having some technical difficulties. So I am just going to talk at you and then um, I'll link over to the stuff on the website or try to direct you to it somehow. But first, I just wanted to say, you know, I think it's really, and this, this, this picks up on something Risa was saying, but I think it's really important to um, frame what, what's really at stake here. And, and I think what I would do, I would want to say as well is um, the COVID crisis, the pandemic and um, the economic crisis and the impacts that that's having on our campus, right? The sort of disaster capitalism model is, um, is really, uh, it's, it's laying bare fault lines that have already, you know, been present in higher education. Um, so, you know, I think, to me, I think about COVID, this COVID crisis is obviously it's a pandemic, it's a health crisis, there's an economic crisis that goes along with it. But I what's happening in higher education to me doesn't feel terribly different from what was going on before. It just feels sped up and sort of more compressed and extreme. So, you know, a couple things I think to keep in mind, right? If we think about it and the sort of neoliberal model that's been foisted on us since, you know, really since probably the late 70s, early 80s with the defunding of public goods in general, is that corporatization and contingentization have really undermined a coherent sense of the profession. Um, and also I think a shared social understanding of the role of higher education. Um, and uh, specifically higher education as a, as a public good. And that seems to me, when you're talking about organizing, that seems important for a couple reasons. And one is, um, you know, if we don't have a coherent sense of ourselves as a shared group, um, that, you know, that, that's a pressure, right, against um, successful organizing. And then I think if, you know, if, if we don't have a shared understanding with, with, um, with you know, our society of what our role is in the society, that also has a, you know, it's just a force that, it's, it's, that we have to overcome as we're organizing. Um, and, you know, obviously this is all part of this attack on public goods, specifically attacks on education, I think. And I won't um, give too much of a personal narrative except just to say that, um, I spent uh, five and a half years in Wisconsin, I guess. I went there right before they got uh, collective bargaining legislation through for the University of Wisconsin system. And there's a couple of UW people on, on this call, so they know of what, of what I speak. Um, and then of course, you know, uh, uh, the Act 10, the Budget Repair Act in Wisconsin happened in 2011 and completely eviscerated uh, the union movement there, including in higher education, but it was also an attack on public goods in general. It was an attack on K-12, it was an attack on higher ed, it was an attack on public services of all sorts. Um, so I think it's just that's, you know, that's another part of this context. And, um, you know, I think when we think about our own workplace and sort of the attacks on academic freedom and on job security, we have to really see these as part of this larger, this larger um, attack. So that's just something I want people to be thinking about. So um, when, you know, what we think about at AAUP is how do we organize to, to sort of reclaim um, that, that shared sense of uh, the common good, right? Um, and there's a number of different ways to do this. Um, I will probably send my slides because I had a groovy picture of a librarian at Rutgers. Um, and, uh, you know, I think part of it is people, you know, we're starting to see faculty awaken and organize around these, around these principles. And um, one of, you know, part of what AAUP has done is put together some campaign resources. So we're a national organization. We have, as Risa said, we have members, uh, we have about 80 collective bargaining chapters. So you know, 80 campuses where members engage in collective bargaining, where they're in unions, and those include tenure line faculty, non tenure track faculty, and uh, uh, part time contingent faculty, graduate employees, academic professionals, uh, research assistants. Um, and some campuses on the West Coast postdocs are in those units as well. Um, so we really kind of cover the whole 
profession. And one of the ways we frame this is through a campaign that we call the One Faculty Campaign. And that really came out of this idea that, um, that you know, we had to push back on all of these forces that were dividing us. And one way of doing that is to reclaim a coherent view of the profession. And, you know, all those who teach and research in higher education are doing the work of faculty. Just because um, neoliberal forces and the corporate university have decided to redefine what faculty means, you know, that it, that's irrelevant to us. If you're teaching a class, if you're engaged in research, if you're um, engaged in you know, the work that used to be bundled into a faculty job and has now been unbundled, you know, we see you as faculty and we see you as part of the work of, um, you know, the, the, the falls under the AAUP's umbrella and the AAUP's mission. And um, that kind of came out of this, again, I'll sort of give um, a shout out to, to Wisconsin. Uh, after Act 10, I was talking to uh, somebody uh, at AFSCME and he was talking about how they were starting to organize in the private sector, because AFSCME traditionally represents uh, public sector workers. And as public sector work was getting privatized, they were moving over and organizing, you know, private sector workers. And he said, we follow the work, it's our work. It doesn't matter that it's not public sector work anymore, it's our work. And so at AAUP, when we kind of came up with this idea for a one faculty campaign, the way we framed it in our heads was we follow the work. You know, somebody can say, well, that's not really faculty work because it's, it's being done by a, a graduate instructor or a part-time, you know, uh, contingent faculty member or whatever. And we would say, well, we follow the work. You know, that's, that's the work and everybody who does that work deserves the same rights and protections and dignity. So that's really kind of the um, approach behind the one faculty campaign. And, um, you know, let's see, let's see if I can link to it. That would be cool if I could show you. Uh, so from there, we really kind of developed a um, notion of, uh, post the Trump election, sort of what's the next step with one faculty? And we started thinking about one faculty, one resistance, um, because we thought, you know, how do we not only talk about ourselves as a, a coherent profession engaged in defending rights in the profession, you know, how do we locate ourselves in this larger resistance against um, the political economy that you know the kind of mess we find ourselves in i suppose so i'm going to link to that i'm going to try this again and um I'll, I'll try to show you our, our website and walk you through some of the campaign toolkits we have on there real quickly uh did that work yes that did work oh sweet so you're looking at um, the One Faculty, One Resistance website. And what we have on there, and this is open to anybody, whether you're a member or not, but what we really hope is that people become members of the AAUP. But what we have on there right now are a number of featured campaigns. And these are national campaigns that we're running. And um, we put together these toolkits and what happens, you know, how we've seen them work, for instance, like the faculty anti-privatization network is a really good uh, example. We have information on here sort of defining the privatization problem. And then we have toolkits about how you can take action, sorry, you know, how to educate yourself and your colleagues. Um, and, you know, if you click through there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's available, right? Um, you know, 10 reasons why you should care if your own, own course is online, primer on privatization, uh, important things to look at with um, OPM contracts, um, analyses of OPM contracts, you know, just, just a lot of information. This is um, kind of timely given the fact that on a lot of campuses we've, uh, this, this precedes COVID, but of course, you know, with, um, with the pandemic, a lot of our uh, a lot of our um, members have found themselves, you know, move, have had to move their teaching remotely and um, have kind of come up against questions regarding, you know, basically what we would consider, you know, the, the two-pronged problem, one, the academic freedom of controlling your own course content, <laughs> your course, 
Um, and then number two, um, the question of uh, how decisions are made about, you know, ownership of a course, you know, uh, IP decisions around that, which um, AAUP really believes are not just decisions of the individual faculty, but are decisions of the faculty as a whole, that vis-a-vis -a, -vis a collective bargaining agreement or your shared governance body, you know, there should be some sort of shared uh, group of, you know, shared guidelines, shared, um, you know, uh, processes for how those decisions are made and that, you know, the faculty member ultimately owns it unless there is a very clear and coherent decision not to. So anyhow, we have this whole thing on here. Step two, build consensus with resolution. So, um, you know, this is a whole section on how to organize your colleagues around this, right? Um, and then we have, uh, a step three, which is, you know, write and win a new policy on your campus. For instance, if you're on a campus where suddenly everybody's being forced to use um, an OPM and, uh, you know, the institution is saying, like, it's department by department how these contracts are going to work, or we've negotiated a contract and it just applies to all of you. Um, you know, what we're saying is that's that's not how this is supposed to work. And one thing you could be organizing around on your campus that's that's really valuable uh, is, is, you know, the protection of um, the faculty prerogative when it comes to um, uh, teaching and curriculum. So that's one of our uh, toolkits. Um, we have a couple other free speech on campus, targeted harassment of faculty. Um, and again, the free speech on campus one, I'll just show to you really quickly. Um, this is really focused on um, free speech legislation that's come out of these, uh, the Goldwater Institute in Arizona and that's popped up in a lot of states around this idea of, you know, these wild and crazy faculty are uh, indoctrinating students with all sorts of crazy ideas and it needs to be fair and balanced and all this. So this one is really more of a legislative campaign, although certainly there's a chapter building or a movement building on campus aspect to it. And, um, you know, we include things in here uh, like a primer on legislation because all of this legislation looks the same. It all comes from the Goldwater Institute. You know, the states, it's popped up in, I think, over 20 states at this point. It hasn't been enacted in 20 states, but it's popped up in legislatures uh, all over the country and it always looks the same. So we have this primer for people. Um, five actions to take. So again, you know, very action oriented things that you can do or ask your colleagues to do. A phone script. So if you're calling your legislator to talk about why not to do this, here's your phone script. Um, talking points on campus free speech. So I won't go through all of these, but these are a couple examples of campaigns that AAUP has developed. Um, and, you know, we're constantly working on updating those. So that's, those are um, just a few tools to be, to be aware of. Um, let's see, I'll stop the share right there. So um, we also on our website, www.aaup.org, have information on how to start a chapter on your campus. And, you know, it's really interesting to think about I was, you know, when Risa was talking, I was thinking about the difference between an institution and a movement, right? And, and sort of how things start as movements and become institutions. And, um, you know, the, what, what Risa was talking about with, this, with AAUP's, um, you know, beginning sort of our, our, you know, our creation myth is sort of this moment where AAUP really was a movement, right? It was small, it was scrappy, it was, um, you know, people kind of organizing against these forces. Um, I think in some ways AAUP, you know, obviously AAUP has been around for over a hundred years. I guess we have to call ourselves an institution now, but I, Part of what we're trying to do with these different campaigns and really with um, changing our focus to focus on faculty and, you know, again, using this one faculty model, building chapters on campus, is how do we become a movement again? Because it is clear that the historical moment we find, each, we find ourselves in really requires that approach, right? Um, 
it's, you know, it is not enough to say sort of, here's AAUP's Red Book and hold it up. Um, you know, what, what we need are active organized groups on campuses. We call them chapters and we would like people to organize them as AAUP chapters and join AAUP. But really the, the point is to organize to have power on campus. And I think what, you know, what we see is that when faculty do this, they can be successful. Um, I think there's this sort of, um, one of the, you know, really difficult things about sort of this neoliberal model and just the beating we take all the time is it's easy to feel like, you know, there's nothing we can do or we're up against forces beyond our control. But to, to go back to this privatization network, um, you know, there are examples, AAUP has examples of chapters that have taken this mantle up and have done amazing things. And we're not talking about uh, large collective bargaining chapters, you know, with huge war chests and staff. Um, if our uh, chapter at Purdue is a really good example of this. A few, um, it feels like a million years ago now, but I think it was about a year ago, um, Purdue uh, basically decided to um, pri completely privatize itself. It became Purdue Global. It uh, uh, forced faculty into signing NDAs. It um, took away student rights and faculty rights and forced students into sort of this arbitration clause agreement where you know fa students couldn't pursue um, different kinds of complaints through uh, channels that might ultimately lead to like a, a legal remedy for things, you know, like discrimination or other things. Um, and it was completely through this model of uh, privatizing the institution with, I believe it was Pearson, Lisa can correct me if I'm wrong, I can't remember which one of those providers it was. And our chapter at Purdue with the Indiana State Conference, and Indiana is a state where we have no collective bargaining. These are small chapters. Um, and they're, you know, faculty who are just fighting, you know, for, for, for their institution and for their brothers and sisters and, you know, for their students. And they were able to reverse this uh, through a, a PR campaign, really. Um, and really what they did was expose the NDAs and expose these uh, arbitration agreements that students were forced to sign uh, through the press. And, you know, parents um, and, uh, were um, horrified. And there was a lot of pressure brought to bear then on the institution and on the board. And, and the, the uh, Indiana Conference of the AAUP had two really big wins around that. They were able to get all of that reversed. Um, so, you know, there are examples, right? And I think there are examples, obviously, that we can draw from um, other, other unions um, when you think of the Red for Ed movement over the past few years, where in places where people have just organized and said, you know, enough, we're drawing a line, and, and they've had success. So I, I guess I would leave us with, with just that to think about. And um, the only other thing I really want to point out is uh, on our website as well, if you um, go there, you can, uh, we have a coronavirus resources page. Um, some of our information is members only, uh, but the coronavirus resources page, uh, which I'll just, I guess, give a quick share on so people can see that, um, is, uh, this, this is open to anybody, again, we're not trying to, uh, and there's information on here that I think can be really helpful for organizing around the crisis right now. We have principles and standards for the crisis. Um, we have financial crisis FAQs on fur, that it's, they're really long, um, but there's information on furloughs, there's information on exigency, there's information on layoffs. Um, one of the documents in here that I'm really proud of is the AFT and AAUP principles for higher education response to COVID-19. I think it's been extremely um, helpful to our chapters and to AFT locals and sort of how to respond to COVID as, as it's happened on, uh, on campus. So just, just pointing this out for people to go look at as well. And, you know, anything on here, it's for it's for the common good. It's for uh, for faculty and uh, academic workers to use. So you know, please feel free to take 
advantage of it. So I will stop there and just, um, Brett, I don't know if you open it up to questions now or how you want to handle it. Uh, yeah, let's open it up to questions. I actually received uh, a private chat from Vera at Princeton who wanted to pose a question. So Vera, please take it away. And if you would like to ask a question, just put your name in the chat and I will put you on stack. Thanks for the presentation. It was um, informative and uh, um, I liked the history part of it a lot. Um, to know that this was sort of a vanguard of organizing and on the question of free speech too. Um, but my question is, you, you've mentioned self-governance a few times. Um, you know, I, I, at Princeton, I don't have a chapter. Uh, I'm trying to find other members, but uh, uh, what I wanted to know is what exactly does shared governance mean uh, for the AAUP? Uh, how, so that's one. Two is how do you bring it about where you do have it? And um, uh, if, you, if you can describe the, the sort of minutiae a little bit, are, the, are there internal elections for this? Are they recallable positions? Or, so I, 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 generally, whatever you can illuminate about um, what that means and how do you bring it about and how do you as an institution bring it about and, and uh, how it has played out. Julie, do you want me to start on that? Okay, I'll, I'll just start on that and um, and then Julie and I can do a tag team thing, I guess, here. Um, I had said earlier that, uh, well, first of all, thanks so much for the question. And, and there's lots lots to be done to, to develop uh, the notion of shared governance. And I had mentioned earlier that I had a couple of hats, you know, one is as a professor at Cornell, and another one is a hat uh, as general counsel of the National AAP. Um, well, I actually have a couple more and one of those is that I'm a member of the Faculty Senate at Cornell, which is a shared governance body. And a fourth hat that I have is I'm president of our uh, Cornell chapter of the AEUP, which as, as Julie and I both noted, we call advocacy chapters because we don't have uh, unionization for faculty here at Cornell for various reasons. But so all of, those last two hats really go together for responding to your question. Um, most universities have some sort of shared governance body. So number one, what does shared governance mean? We toss that term around a lot. Basically, it comes down to what I think of as a democratic principle of participation. Um, as, as I said, I'm a labor lawyer, so I see things in those terms um, as a labor lawyer and as a labor person. It's all about organizing. And um, as Rudy Fichtenbaum, who's the president of the National AUP, has said, organizing is organizing. Whether you are organizing, let's say, for shared governance as a faculty senate that's part of your university, so like at Cornell, it's called a faculty senate and another university that shared governance, that governance body, which is a faculty governance body, might be called a faculty committee as a whole. It could be called different things. It also exists at departmental and college levels. So you might have like an arts and sciences department, which is large. There might be some kind of a arts and sciences faculty senate. But no matter what it's called, when we talk about shared governance, one of the things that we mean is that within the university itself, there are bodies set up, kind of quasi-legislative bodies that exist to uh, have autonomy primarily over certain areas. When I say primarily, I mean primary, primarily the power within the university over areas like curriculum and faculty status. So all the peer review we do for hiring and promotion is a result of our shared governance where we have primary authority in those areas. The curricular developments of programs, grading policy, all of those are examples of where faculty has primary responsibility um, to control that area. 
So what we do is more than just input to the administration. Shared governance means we have a lot of authority in that area collectively. And that's part of what I think of as collective academic freedom. I'm going to stop there for a second and contrast that with um, what I'm talking about when I say an AAUP chapter. So an AAUP chapter, like our Cornell chapter, is a chapter that is, Cornell was one of the first chapters after um, the AUP was started in 1915. And just lately, we've been really invigorating, reinvigorating it. And we exist as a faculty collective body, which has been recognized by the AAUP as a chapter of the AUP. And the way that I think of it is that we're strengthening shared governance. So part of what the chapter does is to push and support shared governance through the faculty senates and through other faculty bodies. So they're both collective bodies for governance and participation of faculty. Um, and it's the collective power that enables us to win. In addition to things like governance over curricular issues, status issues, we also think about issues like um, what we're living through right now. How is the campus going to be reopened? What's the nature of health and safety on campus? What sorts of financial budgetary models should be used in a university to decide how to distribute funds through the university? Those are areas where faculty have generally not been viewed as having primary authority, but the shared governance aspect of it means that we should have full and meaningful participation so that it's not just the university administration saying thank you very much for your input we'll let you know but that it's truly participative and the only way to make that happen is through collective power there's no law requiring the university to uh, negotiate with faculty governance bodies or with the aaup advocacy chapters but if you got the numbers and you got the power and you use those toolkits to organize, you're gonna you know, have some wins. You're gonna have some victories along the way towards the broader goal of real democratic governance. If you're lucky enough to be on a campus where uh, unionization is a possibility and the faculty unionizes, well then there's a duty to bargain on the other side if you're working under a law that in the public sector enables you to collectively bargain. But regardless of that, it's organizing. It's organizing. And at Cornell, the chance of unionizing the faculty is probably, you know, close to zero for uh, different reasons. One of them is, is uh, a legislative type of issue. But regardless of that, I treat what I can the same way I would deal with the union. I'm in the Senate. For me, that's the best that we have right now, close to a union. We've got a good advocacy chapter. We're going to act collectively in the way a labor union does. That's what we do. I hope that's, just, that's kind of a thumbnail sketch there. <laughs> sorry, I do, I'm just jumping in because we're short on time and there's about five or so people on yeah. staff. Yeah, yeah. Ira, did you want to really quickly respond to that? Because yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I was, uh, I was really actually fishing for very, very specific things, like uh, exactly how do you get these senates? How are the people elected? Are they recallable? I'm very familiar with the concept of governance because I come from Argentina. <laughs> Uh, and our universities, we don't share governance, we govern. Um, we don't share, we don't have regents, we don't have trustees. Uh, all public universities in Argentina are run by co-governance bodies of representative of uh, faculty, students, recent alumni, sometimes also staff. And we have authority over everything, including the budget, um, full authority. So I, I really wanted I wanted to understand what the difference was between it, it. We don't need to get into this now, but I, my question was about more about trying to understand what the if if the shared governance you were speaking of was like that or like something else. Uh, uh, but mm -hmm. thanks, thanks, Vera. Maybe maybe you can follow up with Risa and Julie after. Um, I wanted to pass the word. Um, Catherine, did you want to jump in, or would you? Sure. I'll, I can pass it. I in the first time at the end, I can. Okay, great. That's let's go to Jason then. 
Uh, hi, I wanted to thank both of you for this really meaningful conversation. It was particularly meaningful because it speaks, especially this distinction between the movement and the institution really speaks to the situation we have here. We have a, a chapter at Hamilton, but I think it only has a few members who've been holding down the fort for a long time. And we have a movement, a kind of spontaneously uh, arising movement, uh, uh, speaking to the sort of needs of contingent faculty. And I wondered if, if either of you have some insight as far as how and we, we're, we've been in conversations about how we can revitalize uh, the AUP chapter, um, but we are, do have some, not concerns, but just some, just a lot of questions about how we can channel that uh, spontaneous sort of movement in, into an institution, uh, especially when the, fir the first priority seems to be building membership, but then you have contingent faculty who are coming and going and for whom dues are a, a more of a factor, but so any insight into how that you see that working out in this next sort of these next few years would be helpful. Sure, and I can try to answer that really quickly. And if you want to follow up afterward, because I'm cognizant of the time and I don't, you know, I want to. Let's take time. But also, yeah. Let's take ten more minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, first of all, and I think this was something I meant to I meant to raise this earlier, but. Um, under AAUP's constitution, if there is a chapter on campus. Uh, I mean, this, and I know this is not what's going on in Hamilton, but I, I just feel like I need to say it because um, anybody who's eligible for membership in AAUP has and wants to be has to be included in the chapter. Like you can't have a tenure track chapter. I mean, if you have a unionized campus, you may be able to do something like that because of the way bargaining units break down under you know different different uh, schemes, but. Um, but you know the chapter should be inclusive. Mm -hmm. So one of the things you know this is sort of where I think the one faculty campaign can be really helpful. So we have this one faculty one resistance website I showed you, but we also that grew out of something that we did a few years before that just called the one faculty campaign, which really included very specific tactics for for how to how to build a chapter that's inclusive of um, faculty in precarious positions and how to you know really build solidarity and work together um, you know this this is going to sound really um, it's sort of a no duh type thing but one of the things I think probably that's really good to do and I'm sure you're already doing this is but just one-on-one -on -one conversations with people you know, we'd love to have we'd love to have the work you're doing over here as part, you know, to to protect and defend contingent faculty be part of the work that the chapter's doing. You know, how could we do that? What do you think the chapter could do differently? How could you know? I mean, the really sort of that organizing conversation with people to 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 bring them in and to um, you know acknowledge acknowledge their issues and really hear from them. Um, I think one of the challenges sometimes our chapters have is that, um, you know, um, we don't always listen as well as we need to. I mean, I know I don't always listen as well as I need to. So, I mean, that's one of the things I would, I would say. Um, I know that, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll just say, I know there, there's a couple there's a, there are a couple participants on this call from UW Milwaukee where we have a really active advocacy chapter, and I know they were very purposeful when they built it uh, in thinking how to build it to be inclusive of grad employees and contingent faculty, and um, which they don't even call those people faculty in Wisconsin; they call them staff, and uh, then also the tenured faculty. So that's also um, you know I'll just I'll just say that that's that's a if you're looking for real practical advice they they may have some as well can i follow up for just a second um one thing i wanted to to point out with regard to the question is i think sometimes what happens i know our my experience here at cornell is that you get groups that get going on an issue that's of interest to you know faculty across the board as as julie's saying and generally the the population you know in the community and it gets off the ground but i think that for the chapter what what is really important to think about is how to integrate those questions that when issues come up it can be a really important issue campaign for the chapter to build i think right now there are so many particular issues that people can collectively join around that this is a really good moment to build the chapter because it's one of those, if you build it, they will come, right? If you have something on the agenda that's very specific about uh, retaining jobs, 
right, about, you know, about issues of pay cuts, about health and safety, the chapter can really be central to uh, building coalitions and organizing around those issues. And those toolkits that Julie was pointing out can be really helpful. Thank you. Uh, next on stack, um, Katrin is actually going to jump in now. Oh, okay. Uh, so I just had a, a question about the distinction between private and public universities. And um, in, in your experience, and uh, Riza, you were bringing up how at Cornell you'd think there would be no sort of real traction for major unionization uh, among faculty. How um, is AAUP, does, do you have any campaigns that are working on changing le legislation on that matter? Um, is there any you know, drive to, to sort of switch those, um, those conditions for, for tenured faculty at private institutions to be able to unionize? Julie, do you want to start on that from sort of the AUP vision of it? And I can do some specifics. Sure. If you want. So I think one of the, you know, one of the challenges is that there's, um, you know, and I, I think most of you are probably aware of the yeshiva decision, right? Which really, it, the, the, you know, basically makes it, um, it doesn't make it impossible for faculty to unionize, but it, it puts it sort of outside of the legal framework for unionization for tenure line faculty, right? Because of a whole bunch of reasons. And Risa's written really good stuff on that. So again, check it out on our website, you know, about the managerial status of faculty because of the control they have over their own work, right? Um, so for us, you know, when you just kind of do a scan of the you know the justice system and um the the federal legislative branch um not to mention the white house um you know it's not really i think a legislative change any kind of change that you know would go through sort of a legal framework right now is is probably you know a, a quixotic i guess i would say um now but to go back you know there are places where we have collective bargaining chapters that um, of tenured faculty that precede yeshiva, and they've been able to hold on to their unions and to their um, contracts. And the way that they've been able to do it is um, these chapters have, and I'm not, I'm not um, exaggerating. They have like 99% membership or uh, one of them that was hovering at 98% membership just got up to 100% membership because of, you know, the administration's bad behavior in response to COVID. I mean, the way those chapters maintain um, collective bargaining is by, you know, a completely organized workforce, right? So, you know, one could extrapolate from that, and I still think it would be an uphill battle, but I do think there are situations in the private sector in higher education where if faculty really organized kind of a, you know, wall to wall, right? Like all the faculty joined, all the faculty were committed to it, you know, and again, I think we've seen models of this with the Red for Ed in, you know, places like Arizona, West Virginia, you know, not union states, right? Um, you know, it is possible to achieve uh, something that, e even if there is not a collective bargaining agreement, something that really acts like a union in every respect. And I think, you know, from our point of view right now, that is a um, a much, uh, you know, believe it or not, it's an it's an easier lift. I mean, it's easy, you know. Um, so that, you know, that's what we really encourage faculty, tenure line faculty in the private sector, of course. Uh, part-time faculty and some non-tenure track faculty uh, have the right to organize for now <laughs> under the NLRB, um, have the right to organize for collective bargaining, organize unions. Um, so, you know, that's an option there as well. But really, I mean, we find if, if workers stand together, they can have a union or something that really looks like a union, even in private uh, institutions. Um, yeah, I don't know, Risa, if you have more to add to that. Yeah, well, just um, a couple of things. One is between 1970 and 1980 in the private sector and private, union, private universities, there was a real uptick, an uptick in unionization um, under the National Labor Relations Act in the private sector. So it was 1980 when this yeshiva decision was decided by the Supreme Court basically to shut down uh, organizing by faculty. 
But as Julie's pointed out, regardless of that, people organize. That's the nature of shared governance. It's organizing. And so all of those issues really add up to organize. There's an old line of, you know, if the law is, is for you, but you don't have the collective power, it doesn't, you know, you're not going to be able to organize. But if you've got the collective power and you don't have the law, it doesn't matter because you've got the power. So it's really about organizing, organizing, and then figuring out what structures will work for you. Thank you. Um, Tian An, did you want to uh, ask your question? And then if we have time, Tim, we're pretty close to the end. Sure. Um, thanks for uh, taking the time. Um, actually, what I have is maybe more of a request than a question, actually, but hopefully it's, it'll be instructive to people here, too, um, about how you... So I'm at Smith, um, a condition faculty, and just to talk about how like we've been able to try to build this from the ground up. Um, so since the pandemic, we sort of started to organize around hiring freeze, and the uh, AAUP chapter here, um, they're pretty small. I think they're like between 10 and 20 people, I think, um, at least the more active members. And... Um, but they've actually been our sort of strongest uh, non-contingent faculty allies, I guess, uh, in, in terms of organizing. Um, so for example, yesterday, they, they took a very long time to, well, they, um, they issued a statement finally to the administration sort of in support of you know, contingent faculty. Um, and uh, it was just, and it, it took a long time for them to come to a, a consensus vote just to have the letter be done. Um, but, yeah, I guess, um, and so it's, it's, that was the sort of the, the, the biggest link that we had to like non-tenure track, I mean, sort of, I guess, sorry, non-tenure, that we had to non-contingent faculty uh, and sort of tenured faculty who sort of knew more than we did and had about the history of the institution and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I guess, you know, maybe more of a request, like if there's any way you could like signal boost that somehow, uh, that would be maybe really awesome. Uh, but. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. And we have a really active state conference in Massachusetts that, um, and we have uh, the chair of our committee on our National Committee on Governance, Mike DeCesar is at Merrimack and he's really active in the Massachusetts conference. So I mean, I could definitely let him know what's going on at, at Smith and, um, and, you know, there might be some connections and collaborations that can be built and also um, you know that that might help amp what you're doing as well thank you for letting us know about it though mm -hmm. cool. thanks I, I just wanted to mention also for I for there's I'm sure a mix of people who are in universities that have um, chapters AAP chapters and some that don't having gone through the kind of reinvigoration recently here of our chapter I can tell you, it's, it's actually very easy to start a chapter. It feels like, oh my gosh, you know, when am I going to get it together to do that? But it's actually very easy, and there are lots of people who can be helpful to you, you know, in, in starting a chapter. I'm always happy to talk with people, and I'm sure there are other people um, uh, at the AUP who could be helpful. So don't feel like it's, it's some major sort of institutional lift. It's not hard to do. And there is that toolkit that tells you how to do it. Okay, thank you.